Good afternoon, everyone. And we're waiting for people to come in to the session. Just gonna make myself a little bit more visible here. I notice you can't see me. Here we go. So we have 160 people who registered and uh, it's just three o'clock Singapore time. So we'll probably give people a couple of minutes to clear their calendar and join us. So you're joining us today for the Euraxis ASEAN information session on postdoctoral fellowship opportunities in Europe with the Maurice Godowska Curie Actions. And we're also joined by Dr. Brian Cahill, who's joining us from Germany. And he is an experienced evaluator of MSA proposals. So he will be giving us some special insight into how to draft a strong proposal. So it's currently only 18 or maybe people are still busy. Um, I will start the presentation in just a couple of minutes. Oh, you can see our wonderful two faces here already. So I'm sharing my screen. As I said, Brian is joining us from Germany where it is nine o'clock right now. And he is the person because he's a, he's been a fellow himself. He was the president, sorry, the chairman, I think of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. And he is a Marie Curie fellowship evaluator. So he can look at this particular funding program from all different angles. So if you have any questions, he is the man to answer them. Now, people might be joining us uh, in a few minutes. It doesn't matter. Thank you so much for joining us. I will uh, start the presentation. First of all, I apologize. We have renovations uh, at our neighbors. So they started drilling today, if you hear this. But don't worry. The session will be recorded and we will publish it on our YouTube channel and we will also share all slides with you. So you have everything hyperlinked uh, in a couple of days so you can look at it at your own leisure. And if you have questions, please do post them in the Q&A box so it's easy for me to find them. So before I start, just a few words to introduce the project that I work for simply because it really is a fabulous toolkit. If you are interested in finding out what's happening in the European research area, what opportunities there are for you to spend parts of your career there, or maybe work with collaborators in Europe, then Euraxis should be your go-to portal because that's what it is. It is primarily an online portal where the uh, participants from these 43 European countries that you see here on the right hand side, plus our nine worldwide locations are putting all the information in one convenient location that you as a researcher, as an innovator, as a research administrator may need if you want to reach out to European project partners. There's a lot of information that uh, is relevant to young researchers, especially those that are mobile, if you're interested in living in Europe or working in Europe, um, the Euraxis portal provides all that very detailed information. You can see here the different categories that are being covered, but more importantly, the Euraxis project also offers support. And this is, I think, where it's unique because it's not just an online tool, it also has a physical presence. So we have currently, as you can see uh, on the bottom here, over 650 so-called service centers. And these service centers are spread all across those 43 European countries. And there are actual people there, not uh, chatbots, but people who are there to advise you and to support you before your mobility. So if already you're interested in finding out what you need to do from, for moving from Singapore to let's say the Netherlands, you can reach out to the service centers there, but also once you've arrived, they will take you under their wings and assist you with any of the day-to-day -day, um, needs that, um, that you might be confronted with. All of this, of course, is always uh, free of charge. 
The Euraxis portal, the online tool, provides also a jobs and funding portal. And again, this is where you will find all the opportunities from this network that is part of the Euraxis project in one convenient location. So there's always thousands of open uh, opportunities in all disciplines and, of course, uh, across uh, the globe, really, that are uh, waiting for you. We also have a partnering tool. Again, this is interesting if you're thinking of expanding your research network for various purposes, maybe you're looking for a supervisor, maybe you're just looking for researchers in your field to put together a panel at a conference, for example, um, a great tool to reach out and I'd, uh, I'd invite you to maybe put down your own details there so that you become visible to people that may be looking exactly for you for their own project. We also have a hosting database and I'll come back to that uh, later in the presentation because this is a really important tool when you are looking to find a hosting institution, meaning a supervisor in Europe, uh, to apply together for the fellowship that we'll be discussing in a minute, you will find uh, concrete offers on the Euraxis hosting database. Career development, very important. You also find a lot of free tools for you to hone your uh, career skills to make the next step uh, as you progress. And we have a mentoring scheme that I'd like to mention. Um, again, this is specifically for international researchers that are arriving in Europe. So you might be lucky, hopefully, with uh, the proposal for the call we'll be talking about in a second. And then you would be um, very much invited to benefit from this particular program. You'd be paired with a senior researcher based in Europe, and they would help you find your feet and make the most of the opportunity. Euraxis is here in Asia. I am based uh, in Singapore, and I have a colleague who's currently based in the Philippines. We cover the entire region, so if you would like to get in touch with us, just send us an email at our uh, email here, ASEAN at Euraxis.net, and we'll be able to assist you. Now, today we're talking about the MSCA Postdoc Fellowship, and I need to give you just a little bit of background because this is really just a tiny opportunity within the context of a much bigger program, which is called Horizon Europe. That is the EU's key funding program for research and innovation. This program is uh, implemented or it runs for seven years and it is implemented in annual work plans. This is important because the calls are also coming out uh, on an annual basis. And it tackles, of course, the usual uh, suspects, climate change, uh, how to achieve the UN sustainability development goals. There's an economic angle to it as well. The bottom line is that it is open to the world. That means anyone from anywhere in the world can participate in this program, which looks a little bit like this. You can see it has three pillars. The hugest amount of money is for collaborative research. It is based here right in the middle. It's called pillar two. But we are looking today at pillar one, the so-called excellent science pillar, and specifically the Marie Skudowska Curie Actions. And you can see here, this is money that is earmarked for equipping researchers with new knowledge and skills through mobility and training. And this is where you find the opportunities for individual researchers, for individual applicants. A key feature of the MSCA, and I'm sure Brian can elaborate on that later on, this is really, as I said, it's, it's all about researcher training, skills and career development. Um, it's uh, fostering excellent research at all domains and all scientific disciplines. And again, a specific nod here to the uh, colleagues from the social sciences and the humanities, everybody is included. Uh, the focus is very much on international, cross-sectoral, and interdisciplinary mobility, and mobility is what we need to emphasize, because this is a program that wants you to move. The program, as you can see, is not just uh, that particular fellowship that we're looking at today, the postdoc fellowship, but in fact, there are other opportunities as well, depending on where you are currently at in your career development. You might just be looking for a PhD opportunity, or you might be looking for 
uh, something beyond the postdoc stage, but today we're looking at the postdoc fellowships. As I already said, these fellowships are awarded through annual calls. So the call is currently open. It has a deadline of 13th of September. And uh, the call dates for next year are already published. It's always roughly the same time. And you can expect the call dates for the calls in 2025 and 2026 to be roughly the same. You can see you have about five months between call opening and call closing. And this really is the time that you need to adequately prepare the presentation, sorry, the proposal. This is the indicative timeline. You can see that you would hear February next year, whether you've been successful or not, hopefully you have, fingers crossed. And uh, then the first projects would be expected to start around June. Now, the good news is that the funding body gives you 12 months to postpone the start of your fellowship. So if you have contractual obligations that you haven't finished up by February next year, you can still uh, postpone the start of the fellowship by up to one year. So it's a very flexible starting date and all the details of this particular call are here on the funding and tender portal. I have hyperlinked all the slides and as I said, I will share them with everyone later on so you have all the information at latest tomorrow. Now, what is this program? As you can see, it's a mono beneficiary action to support postdoc research and career progression. Mono beneficiary means it's for an individual applicant. I want to emphasize that this is very much focused on two-way mobility. There are in fact two aspects to this fellowship. We have the European postdoc fellowships, and these are for applicants that want to come to Europe. Like you, for example, based in Singapore currently, you want to go to Europe, you would apply for the European postdoc fellowship. There's also an outgoing element to this. We have the global postdoc fellowships. I'm gonna mention them at the, big, at the end of my talk. This is for applicants that want to go outside of Europe. So anyone who is currently based in Europe and they want to spend part of this fellowship in the country beyond the European research area, they can apply for the global postdoc fellowships. Now, what is this? As I said, it's a personal postdoc fellowship for an individual applicant. There is no age limit. It's funded for one to two years. It depends on the scope of the project that you're proposing. You can apply with an academic or a non-academic host. So for example, an industry partner can be a host as well. It's open to all nationalities. So if you're joining us from Singapore, but you're not Singaporean, it doesn't matter. And it's open to all domains of research and innovation. The key principle is the bottom of principle, meaning there are no predetermined thematic focus areas. So the commission is not deciding a certain number of uh, fellowships need to go to specific sectors. It's entirely up to uh, how good the proposal is. Who can apply? Applicants, first of all, must have a PhD degree at the time of the deadline, 13th of September. And you must not have more than eight years of research experience. I want to emphasize this. I always get a lot of questions where people say, oh, I only just finished my PhD. Well, that's perfect. You must, you must not have uh, eight years. You only cannot have more than eight years. Uh, the funder is quite flexible in that you can discount certain periods where you haven't actually done full-time research. Uh, I've put here at the bottom of this slide, a hyperlink to a self-assessment tool where you can calculate uh, whether you're still within that bracket or not. And thirdly, the third rule, and Brian will elaborate on that in a minute, is the mobility rule. And that means you must not have resided or carried out work in the country where you want to go to in Europe for more than one year in the past three years. So if you've just come back, for example, from a postdoc or a PhD in Spain, you must choose another country besides Spain for your host institution. Uh, it's very much about a, a partnership between the postdoc and the host. The host is also sometimes called the beneficiary. So you uh, must not develop this proposal by yourself and then you just send it off and see whether someone is interested, but you have to develop this jointly. 
with the host institution, meaning your supervisor. And that host institution, as I said, can be an academic or a non-academic sector, but they must be based in either one of the European Union member states or in a country that's associated with the Horizon Europe program that I introduced you to at the beginning. And here you can see which countries are included on the right-hand side, the 27 EU member states. And yes, the UK is missing there. On the left are the 16 currently countries associated with Horizon Europe. So any of these countries can be uh, the ones where you identify your supervisor, your host institution. This is just a quick overview of the funding that you will receive. Uh, as a bottom line, it's a very generous grant that you will receive, uh, you really can focus entirely on your project. Um, there is, as you can see at the bottom, a country correction coefficient that applies, meaning if you live in a country where uh, living expenses are higher or lower, the grant will be adjusted um, accordingly. Submission and evaluation, and I will talk very briefly on this because Brian is the expert on this. There are three criteria that will be used to evaluate the project, excellence, impact, and quali quality and efficiency of the implementation. For me, just to say quickly, if you applied last year to the 2022 call, you must have a score of at least 75% to be able to apply again. I'm not sure how many people are uh, affected by this. Here is uh, details on what is uh, meant uh, by this and how you have to understand these three uh, criteria. Again, I'm not going to say a lot because I don't want to preempt uh, Brian with his presentation. Um, the submission is uh, carried out through the funding and tender portal. So the Commission has uh, an online platform and this is the only way you communicate with, with uh, the funder. This is the mailbox, so to say, and it is submitted by the beneficiary. The beneficiary will be the institution in Europe that will uh, host you, but you'll have to draft the proposal jointly, um, as I said. Now, how would you get started? Just some quick advice from me. First of all, I think you would need to check uh, whether you're eligible or not. And I would think you should perhaps also see whether this is the right um, funding for you at the point in time where you are in your, in your career. I've put a lot of links here that uh, will help you checking your eligibility. You need, of course, develop a research idea. No one can help you with that, but it's important, I guess, to seek support from the community that you work in. Always try to get feedback and comments from as many people um, as possible. And perhaps, I guess, the biggest hurdle for those of you that are based in Singapore and you haven't had uh, maybe that much exposure yet to the European research community is to find a European host. The good news is that we have a lot of tools available. I mentioned at the beginning, we have on the Euraxis portal a, um, a, a hosting office, which we're publishing. I looked today, there's about 400 hosting offers, meaning these are European universities, specific supervisors that are explicitly looking for candidates to apply with them for this particular fellowship. And we have a second uh, database here from the MSCA NET project. They also have their own database uh, of hosting offers, which you could uh, look at to see whether there's something suitable for you. At this point, let me just uh, point out, we're gonna have um, an online matchmaking session on the 5th and the 6th of June. And we will have uh, via Zoom European universities that will be presenting their specific hosting offers. And this will be an opportunity for you to perhaps make contact with an institution to host you for this. So keep an eye on our website. Again, it's hyperlinked here for the details. We're gonna publish this in the next couple of days. And the next step of course will be for you to prepare your proposal. Uh, again, it's important to engage the network as much as you can. We have a, a fabulous network of so-called national contact points uh, who will be able to give you some advice, um, specifically on some of the administrative formalities that Brian will mention uh, in a minute. And again, uh, save the date. On the 19th of May, we have another session 
with a colleague from the UK research office, who is also going to give us some practical hints and tips. And she is going to talk also a little bit about the role of the UK, because that is a little bit of a gray zone right now. Some of you might be um, tempted to choose a UK host institution, and she will be able to give us some details on what's feasible and what's uh, not. Now, there are other MSCA postdoc fellowship opportunities. I don't want to omit them because uh, that's important. If you remember this slide, we were talking about just the postdoc fellowships, but we have another program called the co-fund program. And under this co-fund program, there are also MSCA funded postdoc fellowships. Uh, the difference is that these are not bottom up, but this is a consortium of institutions and they have a particular research project going and they're looking for specific postdocs with a very specific uh, profile. Uh, these opportunities are advertised all year round, so there's no uh, specific deadline for you to apply. It, it would be uh, sensible to look at the Your Access Jobs and Funding portal maybe every week or so to see whether something comes up that catches your eye and that you think might be an opportunity for you. Now, before I hand over to Brian, I know I've seen from the registration list, some of you are also joining us uh, from research support offices here in Singapore. And I quickly wanna come back to uh, the Global Fellowship. So I mentioned this program is all about two-way mobility. And it is also an opportunity for institutions in Singapore to host um, a Global Fellow. Um, if uh, an institution, and I'm just randomly picking one, I'll just say NTU, for example, if NTU would be interested in this opportunity, they would have a partnership agreement with a European, with a European host institution, um, and you would be participating in this particular fellowship uh, without receiving direct uh, funding, but you would be hosting um, the fellow at your institution. How does this uh, look at in, in terms of duration? The global fellowships are a little bit longer. They are between two and three years, whereby there's a mandatory return phase. So the global fellow will go out into the world, for example, come here to Singapore, and then they have a mandatory 12-month return phase at their uh, host institution uh, in Europe. How does it work? Just, uh, just very briefly, um, the Global Fellows uh, would be seconded to, for example, uh, an institution here in Singapore. As I said, there's a mandatory um, return phase where we'll ha they have to go back to the European host institution. That European host institution must be located in those countries that I showed you a couple of slides ago, either in the EU or in one of the Horizon Europe associated um, countries. The project proposal will be written by the postdoc candidates, along with both supervisors, the one from the host institution in Europe and the one from the host institution here in, uh, in Singapore. The uh, applicant, if he is successful, um, would then receive the funding through the European host institution uh, meaning, uh, for example, if it is Singapore as the third country host, they are not involved in any of the, uh, the transfer of, of, uh, of funds. Why is that of benefit? Uh, in a nutshell, of course, an institution in Singapore has the benefit of having a postdoc work at their institution in their team without having to do uh, any of the, uh, the paperwork and without having to pay for that person. Uh, who's eligible for this? Uh, it can be either nationals of the EU member states or the Horizon Europe associated countries, or it can be a long-term resident. So if even, for example, a Singaporean citizen who has lived uh, over there in Europe for more than five years can apply under this particular scheme. And the other eligibility, eligibility criteria are identical, meaning you must have a PhD, no more than eight years of research experience, and the mobility rule um, applies. And this is the same funding as for the European Fellowship, which means that person has their own funds. They even have, as you can see on the, on the right-hand side, 
Uh, they have funds for research training and networking contributions. They have management and indirect contribution funds. So they have their own money. They come here, they work with your team and they create a fantastic link to other project partners in Europe. So it's a, it's a fabulous opportunity to build research ties um, to Europe. There's a lot of information online, of course. If you'd like to uh, research this and find out more, I've hyperlinked all this. Once again, uh, all the slides will be with you uh, at latest tomorrow. Now, before we start the Q&A session, first, uh, th thank you so much. I see people are already putting some uh, questions in the Q&A. I will stop sharing at this point, and I will invite now our colleague, Brian, to give us some of his advice as an evaluator, as a fellow himself, on how to go about drafting a strong proposal. Please, Brian. So thanks very much for the nice introduction. I will just try to share my screen. Uh, can you tell me if it's working? If you can see, um, see my slides, it should be okay. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, so I will just give you some of my um, kind of the benefit of my experience, primarily as an as an evaluator, and kind of tips and tips for a, a proposal. Uh, just something about my own background and my own research mobility. Um, that I studied engineering in Ireland in the nineties, and then um, at the end of my master's degree, I went to work in industry at Hewlett Packard in Bublingen. Um, and I worked there for two years. And then I decided to, uh, to do PhD and I moved down the road to Zurich in Switzerland, uh, where I did a PhD in nanotechnology. Um, then I moved to do postdoc at the University of Geneva in chemistry. Um, and at that stage, um, I applied for a position in a, pro a type of Marie Curie project that doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was a host fellowship in um, at uh, the Institute for Bioprocessing and Analytical Measurement Techniques in Heilbad Heiligenstadt in Germany. Um, and at the end of that, I applied for a, a, another fellowship that doesn't exist anymore, which was um, kind of a reintegration fellowship. So I had another three years fellowship for five years in total. Um, and at the end of this time, I became a group leader at, uh, at IPA in Heiligenstadt. And uh, during this time, um, I became chair of the first German chapter of the Marie Curie alumni and then the, the whole organization um, in 2016. Um, so through working with the Marie Curie alumni, I got involved in a lot of different topics to do with research policy and to do with research funding. Um, and after uh, kind of finishing my job in EBA, I went to work as a co-fund program manager at the University of uh, Edinburgh in Scotland for a year or so, and after which I returned to the uh, TIB in uh, Hanover, which uh, TIB is the German National Technical Library, um, the Leibniz uh, Information Center for Science and Technology. So it's a uh, it's it's a it's a very large library in, in one hand, but it also has a research institute part, which is uh, concerned with how we share knowledge and with a lot of the new digital tools for sharing knowledge. So at the moment, I'm running a uh, cost action, which is a different type of uh, European networking project on researcher mental health. Um, I'm also involved in the Siling Foundation, which is to do with um, a lot of uh, re training for researchers in soft skills and in other skills to do with uh, that researchers need. Um, and why I'm here at the moment is because I evaluate EU projects. Um, I have evaluated Marie Skodowski Curie actions, but also the European Innovation Council grants. Um, so, um, just to give you the benefit of my, uh, as, a, as a reviewer, I think that you, sh you should um, really, it's like Susanna said, you should, you should give yourself a lot of time to write a proposal because it is quite, there are quite a lot of details, which we will go into a little bit further later on, but it's, it really, you really have to give yourself time and give yourself time to write it so that other people can give you feedback. 
um, that the proposal can be submitted early and then improved on. So you can resubmit and you can replace your, the PDF file of the, of the, that you will upload that can be submitted and then you can submit again and th that you can over overwrite your previous submission and this is is it's better not to be caught on the last day trying to submit for the first time um that you should that there is call text you should read it very closely and and the guide for applicants and the details matter that there's also a template for the proposal and you should follow most of the headings correspond directly to the, the the questions that the evaluators are asked so that they will kind of if you follow the template that the, it really that the evaluators can can evaluate from anywhere in the proposal but very often they follow the the, the format of the template and work through it that way um that this is a postdoctoral fellowship so that the focus is really on the fellow that your your research is very important and this is kind of at the very beginning of the project but running through this project is a focus on the fellow themselves kind of where they're coming from and where they want to go so that you have to uh, kind of give your own background and kind of kind of show that you are worth supporting and that worth investing in you so that you can achieve something great for science and for your own career um, um, you should ask people for feedback on your proposal because kind of many pairs of eyes reading the pro proposal will really help you. And that primarily your supervisor is very important. Um, that your supervisor will know what's possible in their lab, and you know what you know kind of your own background and your own skills. But the supervisor will know kind of what is feasible. Because if you plan lots of research that just requires equipment that isn't available in, the, in your chosen lab, that kind of leads to frustration if you get the, the fellowship. So that I think at this stage, working with the supervisor can help you to set up a project that can actually deliver the results you want. Um, also, people who don't really know your field of study can be very helpful because this very often we've got very dis interdisciplinary projects to evaluate and that the, the person submitting the proposal knows the details of the research much better than the evaluator, mostly. So it's not like in school where the teacher always knows best. I think when you get to the level of the postdoctoral fellowship, you should know better than the evaluator and you help them understand. Um, and this is this is really if if it's above the level that the evaluator will understand that it's very good to have people who aren't re who are kind of like in a neighboring field to read it and to see if they they understand it and they think this is research that's worth supporting. Um, you should talk to the EU grant support office in the, at the host institution because they may have a lot of great help. If they are really uh, kind of enthused about this type of grant, they will know how to help you. They will know what's available in your, in your, at, the, at the institution to say to help with many of the details like science communication or training. And these are things that kind of from Singapore, you may not know how this is at the host institution, but the EU Grant Support Office will. So that they may have text or suggestions for you for a lot of this stuff because this is difficult to know from a long distance away. Um, I just kind of how I got started working as an expert um, that when you um, to upload your proposal and to gain access to the uh, funding and tenders portal, you have to register. And that when I, if you go to the very bottom of the of, of the page, there is a link which says kind of work as an expert. And kind of if you click this, you can just fill in your CV and your background. And kind of if that if the EU is looking for somebody to review proposals, they search by keyword or whatever, and they may find your your background and say this is an interesting person to ask to review proposals about. I don't know, Mary Skodowska Curie Actions or European Innovation Council grants, and they come and they offer you a contract for a certain amount of time to uh, to work as an expert. So I think this is um, is how I uh, was chosen for this. Somehow that they they were searching and they found my 
my background and I thought it, it might be good for this sort of work. Um, that the evaluation process is quite complicated. <laughs> um, that when uh, in the middle of September, there's a deadline and kind of within a very short, uh, that I was approached in maybe June, July and asked, will I be available in September? And if you say yes, then they send you a contract maybe before the deadline date. And once the deadline happens that the people at the research um, at the OREA kind of really look at the eligibility criteria, kind of the eight years and that you haven't spent more than one year of the last three years in the host country and so on. They look at all of this and then they say these 5% uh, have, are ineligible and they don't send them to reviewers. And then within a very short time, it's like a week and a half, they start sending out um, uh, kind of proposals in, they tell you, you have eight proposals this year and they send them out to you. And then you have something like um, a, a, a certain amount of time to, to review them. But this isn't, that there's this, if they say kind of they want everything finished by the 2nd of December, they really like to have everything finished the first week of November. So that means that the first reviews are done within the first two or three weeks. And this means that you you're it's quite intensive time for where most of the reviewers have another job so that they fit this reviewing process in probably uh, late at night or kind of after you know kind of from eight o'clock whenever it is they have time if they get up early in the morning they can do it then too but I think this is is quite that it, first of all you have three reviewers who write these um, their reviewer reports and then this then the, the last kind of from mid October they write um, kind of they have to agree on a consolidated report and this is one of the experts becomes a, a the rapporteur and is in control of the process and writes the the basic um, report. And this has to be agreed by the other two reviewers with a, with a score. After that, there are, a, there are a lot of quality control from uh, vice chairs and there is discussion. And I, I wasn't involved in this, but I think you can see from the, from the, from the, from the graphic that the, once that once this at the, in mid, at the beginning of December, once this is decided, that there is still a lot of work to do to finalize this and a lot of discussion of the language uh, that we are given training uh, on how to avoid bias. We are told that anything that is insulting to the candidate is removed <laughs> by the other evaluators. This is just not possible so that it has to be constructive feedback. Um, this is the assessment grid. We I think these are, I mean, I, this isn't really how it's done. There's a web form, but this assessment grid shows kind of that there is a number of questions. And these correspond very directly to the, uh, to, to the template for the proposal. And so if you're, I, I won't go through all of them at this because we don't have time, but the, if you have excellence, impact and uh, implementation and kind of it for excellence that you look at the state of the art and you see and the objectives and kind of if you see you just answer the questions and you kind of work through and give comments and comments can be positive or they can be negative and if there are too many negative comments you get you mark down and i think it's mainly i think the positive comments i think are, are good but i think that the negative comments can be very very um dangerous and kind of normally that the, the reviewers come and they kind of they, they, they discuss among themselves whether this negative comment is justified. So I think if we if we work through this is more or less it's kind of a, a very very we get four hours to mark each proposal, and it very often it takes longer than that because there is quite, are quite a lot of um, different points to be uh, uh, discussed and analyzed. So. Here is kind of the same as uh, Susanna said that it was excellence, impact, and then implementation. And so I've just kind of looked at kind of what what is asked for is quality and pertinence. Is this important um, of the research and innovation objectives? Soundness, um, quality, quality appropriateness, magnitude, importance, 
suitability, quality, credibility, quality, effectiveness, quality, and capacity. I think these are all very good, but it's, it, I think this, a lot of the time that you have to reach a certain quality and then it's okay, it's not negative. And so that for me that the Murray Skodowski Curie actions proposal means really covering all of the points to a certain level that is considered a quality level. And kind of that you have to make sure that you cover, I mean, if there's, if there's something that you don't understand or that you don't, uh, you have never uh, had experience of before, that you may need help from the, the research office. If it's about the gender dimension, you don't understand what gender dimension is, that this is something that is very technical. Gender dimension is kind of if gender affects your research in any way. So if you have people involved, that if men and women are affected differently by the research, I think that the classical um, uh, kind of area was kind of when they first developed crash test dummies, it was the average man. And kind of the average woman was not included in this or kind of non-average people. So that when crashes happened, that affected different people differently and that men were affected less by crashes in cars than than women so i think you have to look at kind of whatever research you have that it kind of and so this is something that you may never have a kind of you it's kind of jargon that's used in eu projects so that you have to kind of find out if there is any of this jargon that that is in the proposal and find a way to explain it and to deal with it in your project and if there is some element that you don't understand and you write an excellent proposal, uh, but you don't cover something, something like that, it can come out negatively. Where I think particularly in the social sciences or in the life sciences, there is gender dimension in many, many projects. So I mean, for example, or it could be open science, kind of there are particular things that are required by the EU for projects. So I think this is, is something that you have to deal with. Um, I think this, I, I think I will, I won't go through everything, but two way transfer of knowledge is very important. The two way transfer of knowledge means that you bring something to the lab that you're going to, or to the in institution that you're going to, and that institution provides something to you that furthers your career. So that this is, you have to really demonstrate this. And that if you you can supervise master students, you can uh, you know make presentations in institutional seminars. That you have to find some creative way to, of, of of showing that you will contribute, and on a research field that your research uh, brings something to the lab that that lab didn't previously have. And so I think this is is really you have to look into your own background and to find this and then to look into the background and to the research of the, the lab that you're moving to. So I think these are, I mean, this is this is very important. Um, I think that I, I that there was once I think that this link is no longer active, but there is a I mean, it was from Horizon 2020 and it shows the type of comments that the reviewers made about proposals. And I think mostly what I'm going to show is that what the reviewer is like is when you describe everything clearly, when something is very well described, when it's clearly demonstrated, high quality, top level scientific manager, um, the hosting environment is ideal. So this is positive. And when something is not understood by the evaluator, it is not clearly um, demonstrated, so it's not sufficiently demonstrated, unclear, insufficiently substantiated, not sufficiently integrated. So that if they see weaknesses, that the reviewers can uh, really uh, pinpoint these very, very quickly. And kind of that if the training objectives for the researcher are not sufficiently discussed. So it can be that if you go to the EU support office, that they provide you with training, which um, is not really the training you need. So <laughs> sometimes that can happen that you have to really describe the training objectives and to discuss how these provide something for you. So this is, uh, is, is something that you may never have had to do before when you're writing scientific papers, you've never discussed these sort of things, but this is kind of how to make an argument why you should get this, um, uh, this grant. Um,
so I think there's two two more pages, but it's it's I think for for excellence, impact and evaluation, it's always very similar. That kind of you have to convincing convincingly argue, properly conceive, carefully and properly appropriately manage, properly address. So you have to reach a certain quality level and clarity level. But if you don't, um, if your career strategy is not elaborated in detail, there is no clear strategy, there's not uh, kind of IPR is in intellectual property rights uh, and exploitation are not sufficiently considered because this is something that many in people in life sciences, engineering, there may be potential um, uh, to patent your, your research. You will have to say, what well, it's relatively easy to cover. You say, well, there is um, a technology transfer office in my host university. I will talk with them about uh, patenting during the project. And uh, I mean, it's it's relatively easy to deal with. And you say kind of what potential there may be to patent and to engage industry partners in your work. And so this is, but if you don't, um, if you skip over it, it will be noticed. <laughs> so this is where it becomes is not, are not sufficiently considered, and that could be the that could be the reason why you don't get the grant. And it's, I mean, I think sometimes you really have to pay a lot of detail to this sort of uh, proposal. Um, and it's the same for communication activities. Here it's saying are generic and basic. This may is something, it may be, a, you know, generic means that it could be any other Murray Skodowska Curie actions proposal, but doesn't really relate to you or to your work. Um, I think with kind of, I think with the planning, with the kind of implementation, that you really, it can, is something that is relatively easy to do, but you may not have done before. And if you've never designed a Gantt chart, I think one of the ones that kind of stands out is the Gantt chart, and you may never have heard this word before, is just a tool for planning a project. It's a, you can do them in Excel. But if it's poorly designed and not sufficiently informative, which it may be if it's the first one you've ever designed, that you, you need some help with this when you're doing your first one. And it's actually, it's not that difficult to get right, but it's something that you may never have had to do before as, as, as a PhD candidate and you, you, somebody else may have done it for you. And then uh, this is maybe the first time that you're doing it yourself. So it's something you have to, to learn. And I think this is, is something that's relatively easy to get right, but many people can get wrong. Um, evaluators don't have a lot of time that they will spend, I mean, they're, they're paid for four hours and they probably will pay, spend more time than four hours on it, that if they come across a proposal that's difficult to understand, that they don't, uh, that they tend to mark, get, kind of find the faults more easily, then they will mark it down and, uh, and just move on. And so that if, if, if you have kind of a lot of work to do in a short time, that you tend to prefer the proposals that are easy to review, that give you all of the details that provide an, a nice picture and that you understand and you can see the person who's behind it, their work and how that relates to their host lab. Um, I think this is, the evaluators are not always experts about your research topic. That if you're, um, I was reviewing many um, projects in microfluidics, uh, biomedical engineering. You may understand some of the technical parts, but not the application. And if you're, I mean, there may be other reviewers who understand the application, but not the technical parts. So this means that you have quite, uh, you know, some kind of, if you have to read all of the references to understand how the project works, that it can take you, it can be very, very difficult to and a lot of work to review the proposal. So I think that you have to really find a way to communicate um, uh, the research very clearly. And this is not always easy because you may be bringing your own background and bringing it to another lab that is doing something different. So you're also on the same journey. And so to find out kind of really to understand what your host lab and the research work that's being done there and how that relates to your work that fit is very important and it affects the content as well. Um, that, uh, that you are probably more expert on your research than the evaluator. 
in kind of 99% of the time. And you have to show this and to, to communicate your work in a way that the evaluator can understand it and support your work. Um, does it just make it easy for the reviewer to understand your work, that the text should be interesting, easy to read? It's not an academic paper. It's more like pitching your research. It's more like saying uh, why it's important. Um, so it's it, it's kind of I can I tend to write uh, prefer the ones written in the active tenses rather than passive tense. It's it's really is a, is a way of kind of communicating your research that uh, can be easily read and easily understood. Um, that it's not I mean most of the evaluators are not native English speakers. Um, that a couple of spelling mistakes aren't the end of the world. But I think what is the biggest issue is when kind of just misunderstanding or something isn't clear. I think this and so this is what what somebody checking the English should look for is kind of is really kind of to, kind of to, to make things very clear to understand. And this is um, is not just kind of a, a spell check. Um, that the, the references take up a lot of space. The evaluators are very unlikely to read them. Um, I think that you should choose the most important ones and not to overload with references because it's, it's not an academic paper. Some references are necessary because it helps you to be more concise. But I, if the reviewer has to read the reference to understand what you've been saying, then there's a problem. Um, that I tend to use bold, italic, and underline to highlight important points as you go through, and it makes it easy for the reviewer to pick pick it out, and it's a little, a little bit easier to read sometimes. Um, that you really have to show that your host uh, lab, your host supervisor, the host institution, is the one that will help your career to be successful and that will provide you with something that you couldn't have had at a different institution or at your home institution. So that provides an experience that will be um, for your career development, hugely beneficial. Um, be very specific about your supervisor, host institution, external partners, and show why they're the best people to support you. And also about the access to infrastructure, you know, if they have particular techniques that you that aren't available anywhere else that you can learn. I think this is 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 important that IP support for intellectual property training, institutional seminars, science communication, all of that sort of local stuff that you may not know from very far away. So I think everybody is more or less most people are in the same boat. But I think this is really means that before you submit, you have to really communicate very well. Um, that's just well, starting at the, at the beginning, that the first pages should be exciting to read, clear, um, should help the, the evaluator to understand um, kind of what your research is about and why it's important. Um, that's the state of the art. Um, is, kind of, is kind of really closely linked to pitching your ideas and to, to saying why this research is important, why, uh, what problems does it solve? Um, that, yeah, if the researcher should have, or the evaluator should have curiosity and excitement to read further and um, kind of throughout, the, the, throughout, there's a structure for the template and that you should really follow this because this is what the evaluator expects, that everything is in order so that when they go through their checklists of questions, that it's everything is in the right place. And a poorly structured proposal that's unclear and difficult to understand will not be uh, reviewed well. Um, every, I mean, every, I mean it's, it's kind of a long proposal, but it's also short. 10 pages so that every word counts and you shouldn't really waste a lot of space on something that may not be so important. You should kind of cover things as, as quickly and concisely as you can and as, in as much detail as you can. So it, it's kind of like to get the right balance. Um, that graphics can also, they can often be very helpful. They take up space but um, I think at least some graphics that are kind of uh, are well-designed and attractive can be helpful. Um, 
get the layout and readability right. So, so for some tips for clear, concise writing, be clear about your meaning. And it should be sometimes simple is good and could have and straightforward and unambiguous. So in, you should express yourself in ways that cannot be misunderstood. Um, I think to, to eliminate unnecessary words, to kind of, I think even for native speakers that we can add a lot of <laughs> problems that are, uh, you know, add a lot of words that aren't really necessary. Uh, that be, I prefer writing that's direct, straight to the point, clear. Um, pitch the information at the right level, which means that kind of it should be at, at a level that's not too simple and not too complex. That's a diff difficult balance. It depends on the audience. And it may be that writing for an engineer is different than writing for in the social sciences or humanities where, you know, and this is, this is something uh, that uh, in the disciplines, uh, I think is, is, it, that there are some differences. Um, I use the active voice, um, unless there, sometimes there is a good reason to choose the passive voice, but I tend to use the active voice to be more direct and more simple and more straightforward. Um, don't repeat yourself too much. Sometimes if something is very important, repetition is good, but uh, otherwise try to keep repetition down. Um, write positively without negativity, avoid complexity. So um, you will receive the results of your, if you're pos uh, you received the results of your evaluation probably sometime towards the end of January, beginning of February. And after that, if it's accepted, you proceed to grant agreement. Uh, if it's not um, funded, there are other opportunities um, that may be more suited to your background. I know that in Germany, there is the Humboldt Fellowship, which is similar to the Murray Curie Fellowship. So if you, I mean, somehow, if you have a relationship with a lab and you're putting time and energy into, the, into it, there, you can apply for other funding as well. And uh, this is just one of the, the, the ways to make this uh, type of funding work. Um, there's also shorter grants. Um, that are sometimes easier to get. So I think that you should, you should and kind of that can make, uh, the shorter grants can somehow give you a funding track and funding record that helps your proposal, helps your CV. So um, that if your proposal is not funded, there are, uh, you can resubmit under cert, if you kind of uh, receive a score above 70%. Um, I include this, um, uh, this kind of link to Shannon Chance's website, which is really good. She talks about her resubmission uh, of, her, of a proposal that was rejected one year. And that's quite interesting to see the process of how she improved her proposal. Um, there are kind of era fellowships for, uh, for people who are applying to um, hosts in the widening um, countries or, or kind of and, or the, and seal of excellence pro programs for people who just get below um, the level for being accepted. So with that, I will um, finish the, my uh, contribution and then I look forward to your questions. So. Thank you so much, Brian. A super detailed presentation, which doesn't really leave a lot of room for questions, I think. So I think we, we can all uh, be very grateful to have him here as such an experienced person who gives such uh, very detailed comments. And I think what you said at the end, uh, you can always uh, learn from the comments that you receive from the evaluators. And uh, it is a very competitive fellowship so you should not be uh, first of all you shouldn't be too spooked I like to say by this there's a lot of emphasis on excellence and on quality and and what have you you should uh, have confidence in yourself and your own uh, skills and really try and put your hat in the ring because of course it is very competitive but it is also highly prestigious uh, we always say it opens doors and it really um, takes you to the next level um, in your career development. And I think um, with the help of Brian's very detailed comments, you're on the right path to putting together a strong proposal. Um, there have been a lot of questions. I think some colleagues were probably only joining us halfway through the presentation. Uh, you will be uh, given, I'll, I'll send you an email later today or tomorrow, where you will get a, a copy of today's slides and also a recording of today's session. And we have very detailed information on how to go about 
uh, applying for this fellowship, what the different steps are. There was someone who was asking about this. We will share all this with you and you can uh, look at this in detail. We have a few questions, Brian, maybe we can uh, quickly look at them. We already had a colleague who had applied before. And as I said at the beginning, you need to have a minimum score of 75% in uh, a previous application so that you are eligible to apply again. So unfortunately, you would have to, to sit uh, this, uh, this one out. Uh, uh, some other questions here, someone was asking about the uh, professional experience post PhD can be no more than eight years. Uh, can you perhaps, uh, Brian, say a few words about what constitutes a valid career break and how would one document this? Um, I, I know that kind of the classically that a career break is if you took a parental leave. Um, and uh, I, I think this is probably documenting this is probably different in different countries. But um, I think it, I think that if you've had um, a contract that uh, as a researcher and that you know maybe you I, I'm I'm not an, an expert on this that if you worked outside of research in a different um, sector in the private sector maybe I, I'm not sure if that counts as a, as a break from a research career it may do um, so I think that they are relatively flexible in how they handle this but it is. Um, it is something that uh, is part of the eligibility, and if you're ineligible, it doesn't proceed to uh, to the next um, next stage. I know from the Murray Curie alumni, we're very uh, strong in lobbying against this because we thought it would exclude people, um, and I don't think it was. Uh, it, it is it has been very effective. I think it makes things more complicated, but I think this how it's implemented. I'm not absolutely sure because I'm uh, I'm not part of the eligibility, uh, like uh, looking at the eligibility for that point. But as we've said at the beginning, there is an online tool which you can use to mm -hmm. check your own eligibility. I think the key is basically you need to uh, have proper documentation. For example, if you've been on maternity leave, there must be some form of, uh, of document that, that shows this. So this is yes. what the funder is looking for. There is flexibility, but of course you need to, uh, to, to document this. There's another question, of course, uh, Brian, on finding the right host. Are you, as you said, uh, the relationship between the applicant and the host is also evaluated. Now, what makes a good host? Does it necessarily have to be someone who is very senior? Does it have to be one of these top 10 universities that you're applying with? Or what makes, uh, makes the evaluator look at this and say, yes, this is a good match? Um, I think it's the, it's the, it's really kind of when you bring, I, I don't think that it's only kind of this is the institution that's the most prestigious and this is the uh, kind of supervisor that's the most senior because sometimes the, the, the junior research group leaders have a lot more time to work with the postdoc and to give them good ideas that may be more current to put into their into this proposal and to be more generous with their research ideas. So I think this is, is, is really something that you have to look at. And it's a personal match between you and the research host because it, there's no point in getting, uh, because the supervisor is very prestigious, but in the end doesn't really have time for you and your project. I don't, I mean, even if you get the, the grant, it may not be the best match for you. So I think you really have to find the best match and the best, and I think personal relationships and re research are very important uh, for, for, for kind of success and working together. So I think this is something that comes across in the proposal as well. That if, if, the, if, the, if the, the supervisor has given good feedback, that it really fits because this is, is somehow the beneficiary is the host institution and that they also have to contribute to make this a really great proposal. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, another question that's just coming in. Um, as an evaluator, you see a lot of proposals and we know that it is possible to build in a secondment, meaning that you spend part mm -hmm. of your research, for example, working in a company or an NGO. Um, is it necessary to have a secondment? And also, how do you make sure that the secondment actually strengthens the proposal? 
Um, I think that where the secondment strengthens the proposal is in impact because it shows that there is some sort of societal or economic impact that can result from uh, from the secondment, and that is the really the very uh, kind of tangible advantage to a secondment. It shows that you are engaging with the world outside of academia. Uh, where your your kind of your research can benefit from getting feedback closer to application. So, but I think for for some types of research, maybe that's not necessary. I don't know in pure mathematics or in some, hum but even in the humanities, that if you kind of show that you can work with, I mean, with with. But, uh, you know, somehow with uh, society, if it's, and I think I saw a proposal or kind of a project in Ireland that was based at the traditional music archive, which isn't a, an academic institution, but it is, you know, it is closer, to, I mean, it does scientific work. So, uh, which is relevant. So I think you can find ways, and if you can show that you you work with, uh, with society, that, it's, to some extent, you you show that your work has impact that goes beyond just publishing high impact papers. So, and, and that I think from that point of view, it's it's quite useful. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, now we have time for just a couple more questions. Here's a uh, one from Yinju Deng, who's asking whether there is a list of potential hosts, I presume. And uh, yes, you don't need to worry. As I said, we will share uh, today's mm -hmm. slides, and in the slides, I've hyperlinked the hosting databases. So you have a, a, a ready-made uh, database where you find current offers from European institutions that are actively looking to work with applicants for this year's call. There is also, I don't know if you've put in this the MSCA net, which is the network of uh, NCPs have um, a database like that. And I know in Germany, there's one from Covi. Which is, uh, which is an institution there. So I think that there are various different European and, inter and kind of national databases like that. Um, I think it's also, if you, from personal contact, that if you find uh, somebody's paper that you find really interesting, I think that's a good starting point. Um, kind of when you see that the work is interesting and just to contact them and to, say, and to pitch your idea. Um, and also if you meet somebody at conference, that uh, that's also a good way to kind of get to know the person and to work through to spend kind of a half an hour an hour talking about your research idea and if if it's interesting at that stage for both parties maybe you can go ahead but that's kind of uh, that's kind of not something you can organize on short notice kind of if you start looking I mean you unless you're going to a conference next week but uh, it's something that you should always look for at conferences is kind of um, developing uh, networks and kind of partic particularly for research funding or for other career development opportunities. Yes, and I would also suggest that you work with your senior researchers at your current home institution. That's true. Exactly, they're so incredibly well connected, specifically mm -hmm. here in Singapore and mm -hmm. ASEAN, so they could perhaps mm -hmm. Uh, guide you to one of their uh, their uh, colleagues in Europe, and they they then uh, mm -hmm. know what to do. And this program is exceptionally well uh, established in Europe, so they will know exactly mm -hmm. uh, what to okay. do. Just a couple more questions, Brian. Before I think we need to close, there's a very practical question which you might be able to answer. Um, first of all, what is the visa that will be given, and can you bring along a spouse, for example? That is a good question. I think this is something that depends on the country, because in uh, the EU, there, I think that um, these sort of questions about immigration are kind of, are not kind of uh, not decided at EU level. They're decided by the national governments. So I know in Germany there's um, a research visit um, visa. Um, I think that in Germany, because you've got a work contract that somehow for immigration, this makes it very clear that, that you have kind of a way of all of the questions that they have for immigration can be answered quite easily because you can say, I will get a work contract for two years. And so normally when you have, when it's clear that you have a work contract, there are either special visas for scientific mobility or else just a normal work contract, you can get normally get a, uh, kind of a normal um, kind of uh, visa 
kind of a residence permit quite easily. So it's a, it's a matter or time limited for the length of your, your project. So I think this is, in my experience, isn't a big problem, but it can be take a certain amount of time with going to the uh, kind of the embassy in Singapore and filling out the forms and then waiting and or waiting to get an appointment. So I think these, these, this has to be taken into account, but I think in general, it's not, um, it's not, it's not, the biggest problem, but I guess your access have access to, I mean, it's something that the international office, which are normally the your access service centers in the university will be able to help you with this. This is kind of their main um, function or one of their main functions is to help international researchers with uh, international mobility. Questions. Yes, exactly. That is uh, where these your access service centers come in, if you remember from the mm -hmm. beginning. Uh, who are real people and they will assist you with uh, issues like that immigration, for example, but also mm -hmm. what to do with your with your with your family. I have a final question, the big question, Brian, that comes at the end. What do we do with the UK? Now, people are interested, for example, to go to the UK. Is it possible right now? Is it not possible? Um, I would have. I mean, I, I know from last year that the UK has been supporting people to apply. And that there are uh, there are many different things that could happen with this. That the UK could join Horizon Europe, which means that um, everything is implemented um, just like any other country, or that the UK gives a guarantee to anybody who applies, and so that they that the that the UK kind of basically uses the evaluation process from Horizon Europe, but then funds it through their own um, guarantees. So I think this is, uh, is, uh, is one way, or that the UK decides that they are going to abandon Horizon Europe completely, but I don't know what the guarantee is for this year, but I think in previous years, there was always a guarantee. So uh, this is, is something, is kind of very political, but um, I think everybody hopes that this is resolved as quickly as possible, that we have clarity and that um, kind of that uh, we have research cooperation with the UK um, as, as we always have, have done for very many years. Yes, exactly. As Brian said, this is primarily a political uh, situation, a political discussion. We're all hoping that this will be solved soon. Um, as, uh, as I've mentioned, we're going to have a session on the 19th of April at three o'clock Singapore local time. And our speaker will be from the UK research office. So she can also shed some information or shed some light on this issue of the securities that Brian mentioned, because my understanding is also that you can apply. And if then for some reason, uh, Marie Curie funds are not available, the UK will, uh, will spend their own funding. So you will not be left. Yes. Without funding. It has to be said that the UK institutions give some of the best support to applicants to write proposals. And this is, I mean, so many of the other countries are catching up, but traditionally the UK was always number one. So I, I think this is, um, is something that, uh, and it, but it's, I think it, there are many opportunities throughout Europe, but I think the, the UK for many reasons is, is somewhere that people want to go um, and where people get support. But I think uh, we, we see kind of support from, uh, from many countries. I think Spain, Italy have been doing very well well over the last years as well. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us in a nutshell. This is a call, it's currently open. It closes on the 13th of September. It's an opportunity for you to go to Europe to spend up to two years there doing a postdoc fellowship in any discipline with very generous funding. It is competitive, it is highly prestigious. We will share today's slides. There's a lot of information on there on how you can go about and draft a competitive proposal. I'd really like to encourage you. We don't have too many applicants from Singapore, which is a real shame. The ones that have gone are always uh, struggling to understand why not more people are uh, applying. So with this, um, again, the slides will be with you tomorrow and please check our website. Every so often we will have follow-up activities to help you through the application process. And we hope to see many of you uh, in Europe very soon. So thank you so much, Brian. Thank you everyone and have a good rest of the day.